me it's Trishipashi, Trishipashore, I can't say her name. Hello my sweet angels, it's your girl Jay and today I am here with my July wrap up for 2024. I read a total of 22 books this month so I already talked about my first 12 in part 1 of the wrap up so these are the next if you're interested in the first part, it is uploaded on my channel, so check it out. But without further ado, let us get started. The first book that I'm going to talk about is Getting with the Ghoul. This is by my friend Molly Lakovich, and I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. This is the second book in her Sexy Sleepy Hollow series. This is the new novella that is coming out in September, so I am so, so excited for everybody to get their hands on it soon. But this takes place after Arletta has joined her lover, and it follows her best friend Samantha who is finding it very difficult to cope with her trauma and depression ever since Arletta left. She makes the decision that she no longer wants to live so she makes her way to the clock tower with the plan to jump but there she meets a ghoul named Al who stops that jump and decides instead he is going to haunt her and it's kind of their story. As always, I just love everything that Molly writes, and so when she asked me to read this novella, I obviously jumped on the chance. Al was such a fun character. He gives very much Beetlejuice-esque vibes. I think that right from the very first introduction, you can't help but fall in love with him. As the story progresses, you learn more about Samantha and the trauma that she has endured, and it is very heartbreaking, but I loved how Al was there to support her throughout the entire thing. The steam is steaming, as always, in a Molly book. I had no idea that graveyards could be this sexy, but like I said, I can't wait until the rest of the world gets to read about Al and Samantha come September, so I give it a 4 out of 5 stars. Highly Next up, I read Summer Nights and Meteorites. This is by Hannah Reynolds and I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. While on the ferry to Nantucket to visit her father for the summer, Jordan meets a boy and shares a very brief kiss. She then comes to the realization that this boy is none other than Ethan Barbanel, who is her father's research assistant who she has secretly hated because she feels that he is replacing her in her father's life. I listened to this on audiobook. I think that Jordan and Ethan had really great chemistry together. I think that the banter was a lot of fun. I do think that their relationship was very much insta-love, which I am not the biggest fan of, but it didn't bother me too much. One of my favorite parts of this story was the complicated relationship between Jordan and her father, and I really do like how it developed by the end of the story. We do get a dual timeline and a little bit of a mystery behind a certain comet, which I thought was a great addition to the romance. I enjoyed it for what it was. It was a 3 out of 5 stars for me. Next up, I read Everyone Who Can Forgive Me Is Dead by Jenny Hollander, and this one I gave a 3 out of 5 stars. Nine years ago, Charlie was a witness to a crime that left three students dead, and it is now deemed the Scarlet Christmas to the public. Charlie believes that she is more than just a witness in this crime, and so she has spent years trying to rebuild her life since that night. When one of her former classmates reaches out to her, informing her that she is planning on making a movie about this night, Charlie decides that she will stop at nothing in order to ensure that this movie does not see the light. I did really like how things were gradually revealed in this. A lot of it is during therapy sessions that Charlie is having with her therapist where they're unblocking memories that she's had. Because of this, Charlie is definitely an unreliable narrator, but I personally love that trope, so I was eating it up. Up. I do think that the Scarlet Christmas was so hyped up, but we didn't really get any knowledge about it until very late into the book, which was a little bit disappointing. I also think that the ending was a little bit anticlimactic and a little bit lackluster. I thought it was going to be something completely mind-blowing, and it was just kind of meh in the end, so I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. Next up, I have When Grumpy Met a Sunshine. This is by Charlotte Stein, and I give this a 4.5 out of 5 stars. This follows ex-footballer Alfie, who is approached to write a memoir, so he decides that he is going to hire a ghostwriter named Mabel. When rumors about a budding romance start circulating, they decide that they are going to fake date for the public. As Mabel spends more time with Alfie, she starts chipping away at his grumpy exterior and realizes that the 
there is a lot more to him than meets the eye. I am a sucker for grumpy meets sunshine. I love a fake dating trope, so I knew I was going to really enjoy it. I just didn't expect to like it as much as I did. I absolutely loved the banter between these two characters. It is a very, very heavily dialogue-based story, so if that's not your cup of tea, you might not enjoy this as much as I did. It was just so much fun to get to know both of these characters. Mabel is this little ball of sunshine. She has such a positive attitude and it bounces so well off of Alfie who is basically Roy Kent from Ted Lasso personified, which is probably why I loved his character so much. Their chemistry was just off the charts. I did not expect it to be as steamy as it was, but I really enjoyed this. I gave it a 4.5 out of 5 stars. Next up, I have A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed. I was a little bit disappointed in this. I ended up giving it a 3 out of 5 stars. This one follows Effie Sire, who is the only woman in her architecture course at university, and she is more isolated after rumors about her and her professor start circulating. Her favorite novel is about the fairy king who Effie has been hallucinating since childhood. This book is the only thing that truly makes her feel sane. So when she gets the opportunity to redesign her favorite author's mansion, she jumps at the chance. But when she arrives, there is a rival student working on a project of his own. I think I went into this with such high expectations because this book is so hyped on booktube. I really, really wanted to love this, but unfortunately it just fell flat for me. I felt that it was so slow. It definitely dragged for me. I did finish it in one sitting, so I mean, it wasn't a bad book. I was intrigued in finding out what was going to happen, which is why I kept reading, but it just all ended very anticlimactic for me. I can't say that I cared about any of these characters. I wasn't really a fan of any of them, to be honest. Overall, it was just very lackluster to me, but I know a lot of people love this book, so a 3 out of 5 stars is not a bad rating per se, it's just not the 5 out of 5 that some other people are giving. Next up, I read Wish You Were Here by Erin Baldwin, and I give this one a 4 out of 5 stars. So this follows Juliet, who goes to camp every single year. This year she is deemed the North Star, which means that she gets a little bit of special perks. She has her own cabin that she shares with a newcomer to camp, and she is supposed to show them the ropes. But she never expects the newcomer to be her arch nemesis, Priya. I am a sucker for the enemies to lovers trope. Make it sapphic, and I am sold. Put that into a camp setting, and then I am doubly sold. I related to Juliet's love for camp so much. I was a camp counselor since I was 14. I'm now 28. I actually still work for the camp that I used to go to as a child. So this just gave me all the warm and fuzzy feelings. I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a true enemies to lovers. They more so have a distaste for each other, but they're still very civil to one another because they have mutual friends. I loved watching them grow closer as the story progressed and realizing that they actually have a lot more in common than they originally thought. I do think that this book is more of a journey of self-discovery rather than a romance, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. I loved the epilogue. I think that it was a great conclusion to the story. I do recommend this one. It was a lot of fun. I give it a 4 out of 5 stars. Next up, I read Playing for Keeps by Jennifer Dugan, and I give this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. This follows June, who is a star pitcher. She has recently been injured, but she tries to keep that hidden because she hopes to be recruited for the college league. Ivy has dreamed of officiating at a professional level, and the first time she meets June, she actually throws her out of the game. As they spend more time together, they realize that their chemistry is undeniable. The only issue is that it is against the league rules for an umpire to date a player. So they must keep their growing attraction secret, and it's the story of that. I was really excited that this was a rivals to enemies sapphic romance. I do think that it definitely should not have been advertised as a rivals to lovers because they literally talk to each other three times and then they are declaring that they like each other, so it's definitely not a Rivals to Lovers, if you ask me. Which is fine, but don't advertise it as a Rivals to Lovers. Advertise it as Insta Love. I 
think that the author could have played so much more into the will they won't they relationship since their relationship would be against league rules. This also heavily incorporates the miscommunication trope between Ivy, June, and both of their families, which I am not the biggest fan of. This was a heavier book than I anticipated. I did think that it was going to be a fluffy contemporary romance, but there was a lot of talk about family loss and trauma rather than the romance as a whole. I think that I would have enjoyed a focus on the romance more because I think a lot of their connection was not shown to us. It was just kind of like, yeah, now they like each other. But I did like Ivy and June together. I think that they were cute, so I gave it a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Next up, we have Chronically Dolores. This is by Maya Van Wagenen, and I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. This follows Dolores, who suffers from a bladder condition called interstitial cystitis, which caused her to wet herself at school. This causes her to be ostracized and made fun of leading up to her freshman year of high school. She then meets a girl named Terp. I honestly cannot say her full name. My mouth does not do it. I'm sorry. This is her real name. I will put it up on the screen. But she has autism and Dolores is convinced that she can help her gain her friendship back with Shay. I listened to this on audiobook. I think that that was definitely the way to go with this story for me. It took a very long time for me to get into the story as I felt that it was dragging quite a bit. At the beginning of each chapter, Dolores speaks with a priest at a confessional, and I think that that was a really fun, cute way to incorporate and introduce things into the story. Terp was definitely my favorite part of this story. I think that she was such an amazing friend to Dolores and taught her a lot of lessons that she needed to learn. I absolutely hated Shay. I did not understand Dolores's fascination with her and her need to be friends with her again. I just don't think that she was a very nice girl. Overall, it was an okay read, but it didn't blow me out of the water, so I ended up giving it a 3 out of 5 stars. The next book I read was Director's Cut. This is by Carolyn Greenwald, and I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. This follows Valerie Sullivan, who is an award-winning queer actress who is also a budding director. She takes a guest teaching position at USC with a professor named Maeve Arco. Upon meeting, Maeve doesn't seem to really like Val, but as they spend more time together and get to know each other, they can't deny their chemistry. I listened to this one on audiobook. I think that it had some very interesting conversations about the film industry and queer identifying people within it. It also talks a lot about biphobia and homophobia. There are also some discussions about mental health, such as anxiety and depression, that I think were really well done. This is marketed as an enemies to lovers romance. The enemies portion of it is done so quickly that I don't know if I would personally call it that, but I do think that it was a very fun sapphic romance. Val was hard to like at the beginning. She is very complex and layered as you get to know her as a character. She is extremely insecure about her place in the world and fueled by anxiety. I think that she caused a lot of issues for herself that could have been easily avoided if she had just had one conversation with Maeve, but she did go through a lot of character development by the end of the story, and I did like her character at the end. I think that Maeve was a very good match for Val. I think that she was very level-headed and had the ability to calm down Val's anxious mind. The biggest complaint that I do have, though, is that I wish that this had been a dual point of view so that we were able to see inside of Maeve's head. I think that that would have really helped push the story along, especially during the parts where she apparently hated Val, which it was so obvious once they started talking that that was never the case, but I think it would have been cool to see that from Maeve's point of view. One of my favorite parts of the story, though, was the relationship that Val had with her best friend Charlie. I think that the banter between the two of them was so fun. I am secretly hoping for a spinoff that is Charlie's story. I would love to see it. Overall, I think that this was a really fun sapphic romance. I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars. And then the final book that I'm going to talk about for the month of July 2024 is The Perfect Guy Doesn't Exist by Sofia Gonzalez. I gave this one a 3 out of 5 stars. It follows a fanfic writer named Ivy whose favorite show is HMAD. Her parents are out of town for a week, so her plans are to binge watch HMAD with her best friend, Henry, and also actively avoid her ex-best friend and neighbor, Mac. She wakes up one morning to Weston 
woman in her bedroom who is the main character of Age Mad and he is claiming to be her soulmate. She decides to team up with Henry and very reluctantly Mac as well to try to figure out why Weston is there and try to send him back from where he came. This was cute for what it was but I don't think that it was anything groundbreaking. I think that this is definitely geared towards the younger audience of YA. I liked how this poked fun at commonly used tropes in books. I think that it was very well executed in that front. I think that the conversation surrounding the romanticization of these tropes and how that may not necessarily be a good thing in the real world was really well done. I liked the characters for the most part. I think that Ivy was interesting. I think that she was very sweet and, but very anxiety filled. I wasn't the biggest fan of Mac. I think that she was kind of a shitty human being to Ivy when their friendship was deteriorating. I can't say that I was necessarily rooting for their romance, but I didn't end up hating it by the end of the story. Weston was really funny. I think that he was very quirky because of the tropes that he was emulating at the time, and I did find myself giggling at him a few times. My favorite was definitely Henry, though. I think that he was the highlight of the book for me. He was just so sarcastic and funny, and I really enjoyed his character. So overall, like I said, it was an okay read for what it was, but nothing completely groundbreaking, so I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars. Alright everybody, so those were the last 10 books that I read for the month of July 2024. If you are interested in the first 12 that I read, that is up on my channel now, so check it out if you want. Let me know down below if you have read any of these books and what you thought of them, and I will see you all in my next video. Goodbye!